the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor. So with a moment of silent prayer, if necessary, let us pray. <clears throat> And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this day in praise and worship and in glorification of you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we can't thank you enough for all that you have done for us and our families, all the blessings that you have given to us and provided for us, and also for our church, now giving us a place to freely come and serve and worship and worship you by the study of your word and lifting up our hearts in song and in praise. And Father, we just thank you for all that you have poured out onto us, all the blessings you've given to us, especially the spiritual food that you feed us with each and every day our own personal salvation, uh, the indwelling and also filling of your Holy Spirit, and also residency of your Son, Jesus Christ, who also continues to motivate us to go forward in your plan each and every day. And we thank you for your great plan of our salvation. We thank you for your great plan for our spiritual life. We thank you for the plan that you have for our nation, that you watch over it, protect and guide it. And then we ask that you continue to do so and leading it to continue to be a client nation unto you, serving and glorifying you by witnessing the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, within our own borders and throughout the world. We ask that you be with our president, that you continue to be with him and his new cabinet, and all of those that are in civilian uh, government forces. We ask that you are uh, uh, positions. We ask that you be with them and lead them in all their endeavors to honor your word, your divine establishment principles in regard to making policy for our nation and honoring our Constitution. We pray for our local police and firemen also, and we ask that you protect and guide them in all their endeavors, as well as our military around the world. We ask that you be with each and every one of them according to your will. So, Father, we thank you for the time that we have gathered here together this evening. We ask that you lead us now to lift up our hearts in song and in praise. In Christ's name, amen. All right, Terry, if you wouldn't mind coming forward for our doxology. He is Lord, He is Lord, He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you very much, and please be seated. <clears throat> All right, thank you for the doxology. Now let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. And we continue to understand in chapter 5 now about the believer's walk. We noted the first section, which was really verses uh, one, uh, 2 all the way down through verse 7, which is that we ought to be walking in love. Now we're seeing in verses 8 through 14 that we are to walk in light. And then after that, we'll talk about walking in the wisdom of God on a consistent basis. And all three of these are aspects of being imitators of God, being His beloved children. As it says in verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And in order to be imitators of God, it says we need to walk in love, walk in light, and walk in wisdom. When we talked about walking in love, that means agape love, impersonal, unconditional, self-sacrificial love as Jesus laid down His life as an offering and a sacrifice, a fragrant aroma unto God, we too should be doing that on a consistent basis, day in and day out, laying down our lives for God in the, in, in the service of our fellow man of the gospel message. Then we also have to be walking in light, which we are now talking about. We're going to talk more about what light means and the, the, uh, the definition of that, specifically on Thursday, but a little bit tonight as well, as we talk about the opposite of that being darkness. But really it's talking about walking in the Word of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then in the wisdom of God, that too is talking about Bible doctrine being resident within your soul, being applied on a consistent basis. So in order to be imitators of God, we need to have love, light, and wisdom 
in our soul. So in our second section, we're talking about the proof and reason for our walk, and it's all about being imitators of God so that ultimately we walk in His light is what we're noting now. And as we started in verse 8, it says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. But before we get to the last half of this verse about our walk as children of light, we are noting the first part, our former walk, and that is the walking in darkness. So we've been noting the doctrine of darkness thus far, and I've given you uh, the first uh, seven points or principles in regard to this doctrine already, and then I'm going to give you the rest tonight, which is uh, another 8 through uh, 17, about another 11 that I'm going to share with you tonight uh, in regard to this doctrine. But the doctrine of darkness is all about walking in sin and evil, walking in our spiritually dead state as we did as an unbeliever. And even though we are believers now and have a new life in Jesus Christ, we can easily go back to that former life by living under the control of our old sin nature, getting involved in all kinds of sins within this life, getting involved in Satan's cosmic system, and having idolatry within our lives as well, making other things more important than God in our lives. So in this doctrine of darkness, we've been noting that darkness depicts those who are spiritually dead and devoid of the Word of God. Again, uh, the futility of mind, the void, the vanity. We've talked about that back in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. And now we see it again, our former manner of life. And darkness has that connotation. When there's darkness, there is nothingness there is what is in view. And in fact, from a scientific standpoint, I've said this to you long before, but I haven't said it most recently, there is no such thing as darkness. But actually, darkness is the absence of light. And when there's no light, you get darkness. And if there's less, and the less amount of light that you have, the darker it gets until there's a complete darkness, total removal of light in a situation that then is also called a vacuum. And that's why they call those things up in space that they call, they like to call black holes. Basically, it's just a void in space. It's sucking in all kinds of things into it because there's nothingness there. And it be, creates this big vacuum that just sucks other space particles into it, although that's the theory. But they call it a black hole because there is no light in it whatsoever. It's nothing but darkness. And the same goes for the mentality of our soul. If we don't have the Word of God in our soul, if we don't have the light of Jesus Christ in our soul, we're just going to suck in all kinds of cosmic material, and we are the ultimate black hole, as it were, ultimately sucking in all kinds of cosmic material, cosmic viewpoint, cosmic sinning, all kinds of sin and evil and human good within our lives, and we are now not walking in the light of Jesus Christ, not operating in His holiness or righteousness, and we are devoid of His Word. So in contrast to that, we ought to be walking in the light. We are spiritually alive. We are born again. We have the availability of Bible doctrine or God's Word to us each and every day. We should be living in that realm, not in the realm of darkness, which is absent of all those things. Evil and degeneracy, when we talk about darkness and it characterized as evil and degeneracy, sin within our souls, really it starts with the thought process. It's all about the mentality of your soul. When you don't take in the Word of God consistently, you're going to take something else in, and that something else is the abs opposite of light. It's the absence of light, and it is darkness characterized by evil and sin. So again, darkness exists in the thought pattern of our soul as Matthew chapter 6, verse 23, and also chapter 15, verses 18 through 19 uh, speak to. And uh, that is where we understand that, again, if we don't have the Word of God coming in consistently, we have everything else coming in. We have darkness coming in called Satan's viewpoint, cosmic viewpoint, and now we are setting ourselves up for all kinds of problems. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 23, it says, But if your eye is evil, the entire body is full of darkness. And as you know, they say the eye is the window to the soul. Basically what that means is if the eye, and there's kind of two connotations here. There's one, what comes into the eyes. Are you 
taking things in, and if you're taking in evil through the eye, the whole body is deteriorated as a result, and the whole body ultimately ends up in sin. In other words, if you're taking in sin, your whole body will be sinful as well. And that's the inward perspective or the interest perspective of the eye. But you also know the eye does what? It looks out at things as well. And so here too we have the warning is to be careful what we associate with. What things are we focused on in this life? What things are we looking at on a consistent basis? And if we're focused on Satan's cosmic system, sin and evil, or the material things of this world to the exclusion of God within our lives, then our full body is going to also have darkness in it. In other words, now we're going to have mental attitude sins, verbal sins, and overt sins, as we've been noting in these previous two chapters. So again, be careful what, you, what comes into your eye, what you're looking at, what you're focusing on, and then what you allow enter into the mentality of your soul through the eye gate. If it's evil, it will have a detrimental effect to your entire life. So evil loves darkness, as we know. Again, you know, as we say, misery loves company. Well, evil begets evil. Darkness begets darkness. And again, it loves darkness. The more that you have of sin in your life, the more your life is going to crave sin. The more you allow your old sin nature to be satisfied with the sinful, lustful temptations that it is driving you through each and every day, the more it's going to lust for things, the more it's going to desire for things, and the more it's going to tempt you into those things. And it's a very interesting thing is just as Jesus Christ, when he was here for 40 days and 40 nights, and then ultimately was tempted by Satan at the end of the 40 days and 40 nights of walking through the wilderness, Satan came and tempted him three times. And each time, Jesus Christ said what? But the Word of God says, the Word of God says, and the Word of God says. Each time as Satan tempted him, being his own personal old sin nature, every time Satan tempted him, Jesus applied Bible doctrine. And then what did it say? Satan got frustrated and left him. And he waited for another opportunity to come by and tempt him in the future. But for that point in time, he left him. In other words, there was no more temptation. The temptation was gone for a period of time. Yeah, it may come back later on, but it was gone. And the same thing goes with your soul and the mentality of your soul. When you continue to apply the Word of God and say no to the temptations of sin and evil and wickedness and you know, or, or, you know, whether it be the depression that can come, you know, from everyday life or looking, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, lustfully towards things in life, whatever the case may be, whatever the sin is that tempts you each and every day. If you cut it off with Bible doctrine, guess what? It's not going to tempt you like it used to. But if you allow it to fester within your soul, it's just going to keep going and going and going, and the temptation is going to be greater and greater and greater, and your situation is going to become worse and worse and worse. So evil loves darkness. The more you have of it, the more it's going to try to lead you into more evil and more darkness. But at the same time, we also know that it hates light. And when you have light in your soul, evil doesn't want to be around. Evil flees from it, just like Satan fleed Jesus Christ after he threw the word of God back in his face three times. Then Satan took off and said, ah, this is a waste of time. I'm going to get out of here. Guess what? Your sin nature will do the same thing because the darkness hates light. And if you have light, the word of God and the filling of the Holy Spirit going on, darkness isn't going to come around. It's not going to come around as often and as powerful or with as much vigor and strength. It is going to flee and be fleeting within your life. Job chapter 24, verse 13 speaks of that. Again, we see in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, chapter 3, uh, chapter 8, and uh, what's that? Uh, should have a space in a, a semicolon. It's chapter 8, verse 12, and then chapter 12, verse 35, and then also in verse 46. So a little typo there uh, on my slides. But in any case, when we go from darkness to light, it all begins with faith in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, yes, we have to be saved first and foremost. That took faith in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But even post-salvation, if, you're not gonna, if you want to avoid the temptations of your old sin nature, if you want to negate the, 
temptations of sin and evil and the darkness of your soul, you have to have faith in Jesus Christ. You have to trust in Him, and ultimately, you have to rely upon Him and recognize it's not you, but the Lord who is working out everything within your life. You have to recognize it's God working in your life to give you strength and power to be an overcomer so that ultimately the darkness does not take hold. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, Matthew 4, 16, and then also in Acts chapter 2, 26, 18, and then in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. I've got a couple of those verses for you up on the board. In Matthew 4, verse uh, 16, is also a quote from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, so it's basically the same thing. It says, The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death upon them a light dawned. So again, this is a real good picture of Jesus Christ coming into the life of every member of the human race. Again, the light has come into the world. When he came in his first advent, he was called the light, and the light had come into the world. And the people who were sitting in darkness, again, living in darkness, living in sin and evil on a consistent basis, they saw the great light. Now it's up to them whether they want to believe in that light or not believe in that light. They see the light. And again, the whole world has seen the light and will see the light of Jesus Christ in their lifetimes. They have an opportunity for salvation, whether they choose to accept and believe or reject and have negative volition towards Jesus Christ is purely up to them. It's a soul issue and a volitional issue that they have to decide on. But as it says, I love the second half, and to those who were sitting in the land and the shadow of death. What does that remind you of? Well, Psalm chapter 24, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And again, that's talking about trials and tribulations in life. And typically when we have trials and tribulations, you know, it means that there's difficulties and problems. And many times we associate sin with those things or the result of sin bringing those things into our life, whether it be our own sin or the sins of the world that are around us. But again, it's talking about suffering and trial and tribulation. And guess what? Even in that place, even in the lowest of lows that you can be in your life, the light can break through. And the light is shown to you in all of those situations. You just need to believe upon it and then hold upon it. As it says, upon them a light dawned. Again, a light came into their life. That goes right along with what it says in Acts chapter 26, verse 18. And why does that light come in the world? even in the dark places, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. That's why the light has come into the world, again, to turn us from darkness to the light, get us outside of Satan's cosmic system and into the royal family of God and into the sphere of royal family and be a member of the royal family of God so that we ultimately have the forgiveness of our sins, have the inheritance that is found in Jesus Christ and can walk not only positionally but experientially sanctified each and every day. And well, how do we do that? By faith in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then as it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, For He delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. You see, that's what Jesus Christ has done for every believer. He's taken us out of that darkness so that now we're part of the kingdom of light and the kingdom of love, of the loved Son and the loved Father, and they who love us as well. So again, transferring us from the kingdom or to the kingdom of His beloved Son. So the Word of God that is resident within the soul protects you from the evil of this world. Again, whether that be temptations from within or temptations from without. It protects you each and every day. And that's why it's so important to continue to take in the Word day after day after day after day. And it's interesting, and I always, you know, 
I'm not amazed, but I am amazed as I see believers going through trials and tribulations, problems and difficulties, many times self-induced misery and bringing upon themselves divine discipline because they aren't taking in the Word of God consistently. Then they have a big disaster in their life and you think they'd get back to the Word of God but it's usually the last place that they look. And they're still looking for human solutions, human uh, uh, resolution to their problems and their difficulties, looking to the world to try to save them and processes and procedures rather than trusting in God on a consistent basis. And again, I should I said it surprises me, but it really shouldn't surprise me because I see it time and time again. And it really saddens my whole soul, especially as a pastor teacher, to see people going through divine discipline and yet still not turning back to God, still not recognizing that they have fault in their life and they've been devoid of God. They have matayotes within this soul because they're so caught up in this world. It always saddens me to see that and, then they, and see them not turn back to the Lord. But at the same time, it also gives my heart rejoice when I do see people going forward in the plan of God and then returning to the Word of God as well. So again, the Word of God protects us from the evil. And if you're not here to take it in, if you're not listening on, online because you have to travel a long distance, uh, you know, and you can't come here every single time, but at least you're getting the Word. Or you're here night after night after night as I teach the Word of God. Again, that is what will protect your soul. But if you're not taking in the Word of God, you're going to have problems, you're going to have difficulties, and you're going to then, as most Christians do, start to blame it on God. It's all God's fault. No, no, it's not. It's your fault because you didn't take in the Word. You're not taking in the Word. Therefore, you have no power. You have no strength. So again, we see that with the Word of God, we are protected. That's why in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it tells us to pick up and put on the full armor of God. When we come back on Thursday, if I get far enough with the points in the doctrine, there's also other verses that tell us that we ought to put on the armor of what? Light. And the armor of God and the armor of light are synonymous terms for the power of God through His Word that should be resident in our soul to protect us from the problems and the difficulties of life. And so in 2 Samuel 22, in Psalm 18, 28, in Proverbs chapter 2, in uh, verse 10 through 15, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, here's where we understand that we are protected by the Word of God from evil and darkness, and ultimately we would say sin and Satan's cosmic system. So in 2 Samuel chapter 22, uh, in verse 29, which is also... Uh, reiterated in Psalm 18, verse 28. It says, For you are my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord illumines my darkness. So again, we all have a sin nature. We all have the ability and capability to be overwhelmed by darkness and have darkness within our soul. But when we have Jesus Christ in our life, we have the lamp that illumines our soul, that pushes back the darkness and ultimately brings in the light of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's, you know, a pretty cool thing, as you know, if you've ever walked into a dark room and, you know, in our day and age, we just flip on a switch and all the lights come on and the whole thing illumines at one time. But back in the day, up until about the mid-1900s, you know, they either had to bring a candle in or some kind of oil lamp, a different kind of oil. And basically, when they would enter a dark room, they couldn't just come into the room and see the whole room lighten up. Again, they'd come in and right around them would lighten up and they could see, well, you know, most uh, directly around themselves. But to look across the room, maybe they could start to see some shadows and some things over there. But it was still some darkness. But if they brought that light further and further into the room, now the whole room gets illuminated. Now they can see all that is going on around them. And all is lightened up. The same goes with the Word of God. As you bring that Word into your soul, if you've just got a little bit of the Word, that's good. It's going to start to illuminate the darkness that is in your soul. It's going to give you some insight to some things that are immediately around you. But the more you take in the Word of God, the more your soul gets lightened up, the more you'll be able to understand this world, the more you'll understand Satan and his cosmic system, the more you'll understand the enemy and the attack 
attacks from the enemy uh, when they come uh, from Satan and his cosmic system on a consistent basis, and certainly the more you know about human history and what's going to happen in human history. And the more you can see, the more comfortable and relaxed you are. But if you can only see a little bit, you're going to be nervous and edgy. You're going to have fear and worry and doubt because you don't have much light within your soul. But more light that you have, again, the darkness will be lit up, and you'll see everything with 2020 vision, even though it hasn't happened in your life yet. You'll see the enemy coming, you'll know his schemes, you'll know how to overcome it, you'll know the word to apply to it, and you'll just sail through day after day after day with inner peace, joy, and happiness, because again, the darkness is not in your soul, and everything is illuminated through the word of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, For God, who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So again, in the face of Christ, when we look at Christ with our eyes, when we receive Him with our eyes, in other words, take in His Word on a consistent basis, we're going to see the glory of God. And when we have the glory of God in our soul, we have the knowledge of God. See how you can work back on this verse and see how the whole thing operates and functions? Again, you know Christ, you know His Word, you're going to know God, you're going to have the knowledge of God, and that is, means that you're going to have lots of light in your soul, and with that light in your soul, what is it going to do? It's going to illuminate the darkness, and the darkness is going to become less and less and less, less fear, less worry, less anxiety, less sin, less gossiping, maligning, slandering, as we've just read, sexual immorality and greediness and all those other sins that are out there, again, less and less and less and less and less is going to affect you negatively within your life. So again, you can only overcome with the illumination of the Word of God, Bible doctrine within your soul. So as we're going through this, you can see very clearly that when it talks about light, it's talking about knowledge, information, Bible doctrine, the Word of God. And so having been removed from the domain of darkness, we are now heralds, or we are to be heralds of God and of our Lord. And we've talked a lot about the herald, the offering, and the gift in our previous verses in uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, that characterize the fragrant aroma, the propitiation of God that we should be within our lives. And when we have removed darkness from our life, when we've been removed from the darkness, as a result of that, now we ought to be thankful and say, thank you, God, for taking that sin away from me. Thank you, God, for allowing me to be an overcomer. Thank you, God, for giving me happiness even though the world says I should be sad. Thank you, God, for the joy and inner peace and contentment and the wisdom and the knowledge that you've given to me. And in regard to saying thank God for those things, you become what? A herald for Him. Because now you're giving thanks to God and you're sharing that with other people. And you're telling people why you have those things within your life and you're being a great witness for God. And remember in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, this is the great passage where we talk about being a royal priest. Well, what does it say at the bottom? Well, let's read it. It says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Why? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You see, that's what we ought to be doing each and every day, regardless of our situation, regardless of where we are, always proclaiming the excellencies of God, giving thanks to Him as we continue to cycle the Word of God and not allow the darkness to overtake our soul. But if we let the darkness take our soul, we are going to be defeated, we are going to be depressed, we are going to have difficulties, and we're not going to be the herald for God that we otherwise should be. So those in the light have nothing in common with those in darkness. That's another thing we have to always keep in mind. You are not like the rest of the world. So stop acting like the rest of the world. Stop talking like them. Stop thinking like them. Stop uh, 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 acting like them. I said that already. Stop being them, okay? And, and, and be like your Lord. 
Be the one that is positive in the situation. Be the one that is uplifting and exhorting in any given situation. Be the one that stands up for holiness and righteousness and says, no, I don't think that is appropriate. Stop doing that in my presence. Or say, excuse me now, but I have to leave because I don't want to be around this type of sin and evil. Whatever the case may be, you need to be the light. And those that have the light should have nothing in common with those in darkness at all. And that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 also uh, speaks to that as well, along with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. Well, let's go to, uh, if he, we're in Ephesians, so let's look at chapter 5 and then in verse 11. <clears throat> In chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. We'll be talking about more of that in a couple of days from now. But in any case, you know, we should have nothing to do with them whatsoever. As 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, What does the believer and the unbeliever have in common? Again, there's no commonality there. And you should not join yourself up to an unbeliever if you are a believer. And that's a warning for us because what typically happens there is that the unbeliever is going to have sway over the believer. And again, if we are joining up with them, we are breaking the first main principle that God tells us as a believer to not do that. And He gives us that for a reason, so that ultimately their evil, their darkness, doesn't overwhelm our soul. So again, in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, we note that, and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. Then we understand that judgment is related to darkness. When it talks about God's discipline and His divine judgment, His punitive judgment on the unbeliever, and sometimes the discipline on the believer, it talks about darkness. And certainly the judgment of God that is going to come on the unbeliever, throwing them into the eternal lake of fire, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, as the Word of God says, it's described as the outer darkness or the outer gloom. And that's what hell is defined at. You know, sometimes it's, you know, fire and brimstone and, you know, the burning up, but at the same time it's described as complete darkness, which is kind of interesting because fire typically gives off light, doesn't it? Yeah, but with this fire, there's no light. So it's very interesting. So the fire that is described talks about the agony and pain that people will be going through, and the darkness talks about uh, uh, being overwhelmed by sin day in and day out for the rest of of eternity. And that sin is not a delightful sin. It's going to be a sin that is tormenting them day in and day out. So again, it's related to that in Deuteronomy, 1 Samuel, Proverbs, Isaiah, you can see all the verses there, Second Peter, and also in the book of Jude. I've got Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 for you here up on the board, where it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Evil, And again, we're seeing that in our society today. Hopefully we start to see a change uh, of that over the next uh, couple of years. But we've been seeing a trend where the Christian who is trying to stand up for the things of Bible doctrine, for the things of the Word that are saying, hey, this is, is an appropriate behavior. These are sinful things. We should not do them within our society. Well, we are said that we are told, even though we are the lovers of society, by trying to keep people away from the destruction of sin, like Sodom and Gomorrah had destruction due to their sin, the world calls us what? Haters. Again, so it's the opposite. What they call what you, what is good, they call evil, and what is evil now is called good. And what was what is evil according to the word of God, the world starts to lift up and says, Oh, everybody should do this. We should all participate in these things. Again, it's the, calling the darkness light and it's calling light darkness. Again, the same type of analogy that we see uh, uh, throughout the word. So again, it's a substitute, again, the sweet for the bitter and the bitter for the sweet, as we understand as well. Again, I'll read the entire verse. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 
Again, when we get into that society of flipping things around in society, now we have darkness running rampant within society, and the people are blinded to it. And there are going to be negative effects, detrimental effects, individually and collectively, if those things continue. And again, in the slang way, you know, when people say, oh, that's bad, you know, they're really saying, oh, that's good. You know, that became a slang thing. And then from there, now it's not just, you know, saying, oh, bad's good and good's bad, but now it's literally what the Bible says is sin and evil. The world is saying, oh, everybody should be able to do it. You should accept that in your life, too, and, you know, you just have to go along with it. Because if you don't, then you're evil and you're a hater. But ultimately, Satan's world flips things around as the Word of God also tells us, which we'll study in the Doctrine of Light, that even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. The darkest of dark, called Satan himself, disguises himself as an angel of light, trying to deceive a lost and dying world. So ultimately, darkness will be the punishment of the wicked, and which is separation from God. And again, that weeping and gnashing of teeth that I mentioned in Matthew chapter 8, verse 12, that is how that is described. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, the outer darkness, the outer gloom. And again, that weeping. There will be total, you know, people think they're depressed now in this life. Boy, oh boy, when they get to the eternal state, they're going to have total depression all the time with no solution to it whatsoever. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, the grinding of teeth, the grinding of teeth. Total frustration day in and day out with no satisfaction ever coming in life. It's amazing all the different acronyms and, uh, or characteristics, we should say, of what describes hell for us. Fire, burning, brimstone, darkness, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. And that is the result of having sin within the life of the individual. And when they reject the light of Jesus Christ and they reject their Messiah and Savior and ultimately, uh, you know, uh, deserve to be thrown in the lake of fire. So again, darkness will be punished, uh, excuse me, uh, darkness describes the punishment and the judgment that will be brought on to the wicked when God will separate them from the light, separate them from the righteous ones, and throw them away into the eternal lake of fire. Let's turn now to Revelation chapter 21. I want to read uh, these few verses for you because now we kind of are turning back to the light. Because as it tells us in this point, those whose names are written in the book of life will live where there is no darkness ever again. In other words, you and I as believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our name is written in the book of life. And there never will be in the eternal state darkness that we'll have to experience again. And that's fascinating because Jesus Christ is going to destroy the sun and the moon as we know it today and the stellar universe. But then he says he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. But there won't be the sunlight like we have now because Jesus Christ and God himself will be the great light that illumines everything all around us. And it's fascinating when you think about it that as that light of Jesus Christ will be with us wherever we go throughout the entire stellar universe. And then, oh, by the way, heaven is outside the stellar universe. And again... I like to just stop every now and again and think and remind you, you know, just think of how big the universe is. It's absolutely mind-boggling. I mean, we couldn't even, with our wildest imaginations, traverse our own galaxy. And then when you understand that there are thousands upon thousands of galaxies that are separated by thousands and thousands of, if not millions, of light years from one another, just how far apart is that? And oh, by the way, our little sun, if we were to go across into another galaxy, they wouldn't even see the sun. It couldn't illuminate that. But yet, the light of God that then will be reflecting off of you for all of eternity, He could be on the one side of the universe, you could be completely on the other, and you're still going to have daylight wherever you go because the light of Jesus Christ will be with you and reflecting off you for all of of eternity. And again, it's just mind-boggling when you think about the expanse of heaven, and there will never be darkness around us ever again. Now, what I just described to you is the literal state of darkness and light, 
but the euphemistic uh, analogy is that we're talking about there will never be sin and evil around us ever, ever, ever again. Satan and his evil forces, his cosmic system, along with all the unbelievers that have followed him in this life and in this world, all would be thrown to the eternal lake of fire, locked away for all of eternity, never to be thought of or mentioned again by any believer, uh, and never to influence us negatively ever, ever again. And oh, by the way, sin is removed already because of the cross, and our old sin nature will be removed because of the resurrection body. So again, no darkness will ever be around us, and that's what we see in this analogy. There will be no night. So in Revelation chapter 21, let's look at verses uh, 25 uh, first and foremost. And let me just go back. It's describing the new Jerusalem in verse 21. It says, And the twelve gates were were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine upon it. For the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp is the Lamb. Again, Jesus Christ. Then going on, it says, And the nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, for for there shall be no night there. Its gates shall never be closed, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abominations and lying shall never come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And again, no nighttime. Again, there will be no evil ever again around us for all of eternity. And that's also analogous of the gates always being open. You know, they only closed the gates when they were fear of the enemy coming in and ransacking the place. Again, the enemy will never be able to approach us. There will be no enemy in the eternal state. Now in chapter 22, down in verse 5, it reiterates and says, And there shall be no longer... And there shall no longer be any night, and they shall not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God shall illumine them, and they shall reign forever and ever. So again, He's going to illumine us for all of eternity. So wherever we go, wherever we are, inside the stellar universe, outside the stellar universe, we're always going to have the light of God, the light of Jesus Christ in us 24 by 7. So there are there in the eternal state, the influences and effects of darkness are conquered once and for all time. Again, the cross is really what conquered them, but the final judgment and sentence will be carried out at the great white throne, and they will be conquered forever by the Lamb who is the light, and ultimately He is the light of the city, and He is the light of each and every one of us. He will shine upon us and always be shining upon us, illuminating us forever and ever and ever. And again, remember we studied back in uh, uh, Ezekiel, uh, 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 Isaiah 14 in Ezekiel chapter 28, we studied Satan himself. And we talked about the body of Satan in those passages, how it was made up of all kinds of different gems. Instead of having flesh and bone, it was made up of gems, as we know or describe to us, which do what? Reflect light in very beautiful ways. Well, we could almost imagine that our resurrection body may be something like that, whether it be just a figment of uh, a power and light or whether it's adorned with those types of gems based on the rewards that we receive in the eternal state. Because remember, the book of Romans, chapter 15, says that in the heavenly state, resurrection body will differ from resurrection body as light differs from light in the night sky. So again, some of us are going to have more decorations on our resurrection body and reflect more of the light of Jesus Christ all around us than others who are in heaven with us. But in any case, all of us are going to have the reflected light of Jesus Christ illuminating us or, you know, literally the light of God inside of us that is always illuminating us internally and then everything that is around us wherever 
we may go. And that is going to be with us forever and ever and ever. So now that the soul is saved and you and I have the new life, the new nature inside of us, the condition of the unbelieving soul that was once with us is no more. It doesn't exist anymore. Again, we should have that new man put off. Even though we have the sin nature, put off that old man because, again, that is not who you are now. As unbelievers, we were in the darkness, yet now our soul is saved as of the moment we believed in Jesus Christ, and therefore light ought to characterize our soul. And it's a shame when the believer's life isn't characterized and their soul isn't characterized by the light of Jesus Christ. If it is, they're not going forward in the plan of, excuse me, if it isn't, they are not going forward in the plan of God. But if their soul is the reflected light of Jesus Christ and characterizes the life of Christ, again, they are walking in the new man as they should. And as we will see as we get into the next doctrine coming up uh, in verse 8, Light refers to the Word of God being resident within our soul. And if the believer lives anything in the semblance to the normal Christian life, taking in the Word consistently, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ each and every day, you will have the light of God in your soul and you will be shining that to a lost and dying dark world. You will be a herald for God and you will be an overcomer in this life. So that wraps up our doctrine of darkness. We got a little early tonight. We'll get done a little bit early. But in any case, that wraps up the doctrine. So instead of starting the new one, I'll wait till Thursday night and we'll pick up now really talking about the light of God and the light of Jesus Christ in our lives. All right, so let's just close in prayer right now. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to understand the enemy that is all around us each and every day, the darkness that tries to overwhelm us. And Father, we just ask that you give us power and strength by your word and by your spirit more and more each and every day so that we are illuminated and the darkness is put at bay. And Father, we pray that darkness doesn't overtake us ever again and that nothing but light shines within our souls. So, Father, we thank you for our time gathered here together. We ask that you give us travel blessings on our way home so that ultimately we continue to walk in your glory, being great ambassadors for you. In Christ's precious name we pray, amen.